Did you have an interest in design, graphics, illustration, things like this uh, from an early age? I did. I really um, didn't know that graphic design was a profession that I could pursue, but I drew, I, I read comic books, and I, I would illustrate and practice with my airbrush and try to do hand lettering. I wasn't very good at it, but that's that's the world that I was aware of in terms of creative people who use <clears throat> use uh, tools like that to to express themselves. Airbrushing, is that what you said? Yeah. Really? From, from like a, a young age? I would say, um, I, I think this is happening like um, from my freshman to senior year in high school. Okay. My mom bought me an airbrush because she had seen that when we would go to amusement parks, I would stare at the artists who were sitting there painting on t-shirts, drawing your name, doing a sunset or something <laughs> right, like that. Right. And I would just be mesmerized by what they were doing. So one day when she was out on the weekend, she, she must have stopped off at a swap meet or maybe looked at a classified ad mm -hmm. and then came home with this really large compressor. It was very loud and, and, and gave me an airbrush. I was like, well, wow, this is amazing. It wasn't my birthday. It wasn't anything special on <laughs> of an occasion. She just handed it to me and I, I, I knew exactly what I needed to do to it or with it. And so, but you didn't grow up, you're in Santa Monica, Santa Monica now, right? But you were not from Santa Monica originally. No, I'm originally from uh, Saigon, Vietnam, and my family fled there in 1975. Uh -huh. We landed in Kansas City, Missouri, before ultimately winding up in Northern California and San Jose, where I spent the most of my life up until when I went to college. Oh, okay. So wait, how old were you when you guys moved from, you said Kansas to, or Missouri rather, to... Yeah, Kansas uh, City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, we, I think I was five when I moved to California. Okay. So you spent, yeah, basically, basically California has been your home. Yeah. And now, yeah. And now Los Angeles is where I've spent most of my life. Gotcha. And was there, did you know that uh, graphic design was going to be it? Because I believe, according to our research, that, that City College is where you studied graphic design. But was there like, did you ever think maybe I'll just do be a cartoonist or an illustrator or something more along those lines? No, I, I think like most Asian kids, first first generation immigrant, uh, my, my parents had a different plan and design for me. And I should have been a, a, an attorney, a business person, <laughs> something like right. that, an engineer. And I was just like a little bit deviant and, and didn't really apply myself in school. I, I think I was uh, above average in terms of intelligence and school didn't really interest me. Huh. I was getting 3.8 GPA without really applying myself. It just- Oh, uh, you're one of, those kids. <laughs> one of those kids. I, I knew that to get to that next level, to get to Berkeley, to Stanford, or some of the more prestigious schools, you'd have to get 4.0 plus GPA and take the AP classes. I wasn't really interested in that. Hmm. Every time I had an elective in school, wh whether it was from junior high to high school, I would take something a little offbeat, like wood shop or metal <laughs> or yearbook or commercial art. And that's where my interests lied. But I didn't really know, or, or lay, I didn't know that design was a thing that you could do. Yeah. It wasn't until I worked for somebody that ultimately introduced me to a real life professional graphic designer. Mm -hmm. that I thought, whoa, this is something that is possible. And now I know at least one person in the world who could do it. Maybe I can do it too. Gotcha. And so City College. And so once you started studying it, you realized that this is actually quite interesting. I, I could do this full time. Did, was the passion, you know, did it happen that quickly or? Oh, it happened right away. And and this was like in my senior year in high school when I met this graphic designer, I was working at the silk screening shop. And when I saw what he was doing, everything seemed to like, there was the answer I was looking for, except for I didn't even know what the question was. Mm. Yeah, he, he was working on a, a Mac 512K, a little beige box with monochrome <laughs> monitor. And he was doing design using all this freehand and Adobe Illustrator, doing layouts and typesetting. And I was fascinated by it. He had little mock-ups and, and comps that he built for small radio control car parts. And I was just thinking, oh, this is everything <laughs> I've always wanted. I know what I need to do, except for I didn't have that computer and I didn't know how to use those tools. I just knew this is it. And that set me on a course to kind of seek out the college that I ultimately went to. And I, I went back and told my boss at the silk screening shop, I, I think I want to be a graphic designer. He's like, well, oh, yeah, Chris, uh, I know where you need to go. You got to go to the art centers in LA. And, you, and he talks like that. He has a real gravelly, <laughs> deep voice. And he's like, you got to go there. That's the school for you. I'm like, okay, in LA art <laughs> That's a pretty generic name, but okay. Yeah. yeah. So I go home, I tell my mom, mom, um, I, I want to go to art school. And there's a school called Art Center and this is where I want to go. 
And my mom and my dad, pretty diligent, they actually started to look this thing up. <laughs> I didn't know where it was. I just knew it was in LA. It's actually in Pasadena. Yeah. And they found out it's very expensive to go to school. So not only was I not doing what they wanted me to do, they were going to spend in their mind as much on tuition as it would cost to go to Stanford. What a disappointment I was to them. <laughs> Wait, was it that expensive though? Yeah, and it still is. Right now wow. the tuition is, I think, $22,000 a semester. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a private institution, correct? Yeah. It's a private school, yeah. Yeah. I mean, tuition is so expensive these days. And that's something I want to ask you about, actually, um, mm. is because you've been, not to disrupt the timeline, but you've been teaching for quite a while, right? Yeah. I, I taught at Art Center for 15 plus years and at Otis for about 10, uh, bouncing up between the two schools, sometimes at one school or the other, sometimes both. And it was just... It was it wrecked me because mm. if you can imagine, uh, I live in in the west side, right? So I'm commuting probably an hour plus to go to Pasadena. Yeah, and I would go there in the morning, teach for five hours, have lunch, get in my car, drive back to the office, check in with the team for an hour, and jump right back on the street and drive down to where LAX is, where Otis was, yeah. and stay there till nine or ten o'clock at night. And oh, you wow. could just imagine that would just wreck you. Like it took a while to be able to build up that kind of resistance or stamina. But whew, I remember it would need a day and a half to just recover. You know, I was just moping around the house and it's just like, I can't go to work. I can't do anything right now. I am just spent. So I did do that for 15 years before I stopped doing it. For 15 <laughs> years, you did that kind of schedule. That is insane. I mean, 15 years that I was going to say that's not a sustainable way of doing things, but clearly it was <laughs> I mean, for what, 15 years. <laughs> what 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 kept you like, going that way? I mean, that's a pretty insane <laughs> lifestyle, right? Yeah. So I, I, I want to be clear that not all of those 15 years yeah. was like, <laughs> okay, because <laughs> it broke me, you know, it did. And eventually I'm like, I have to stop at one school. I stopped at both. I was burnt out. And then one would ask me back, excuse me. <clears throat> and then the other would ask me back. And it's just that kind of thing going back and forth. But the thing that drove me, the thing that compels me to this very day is the same, is that you you want to do something with your life. And and there was there's things that you can do for yourself, but the things when you do for other people, it lights you up in a way that nothing else will. So when I'm in my cl class and with my students, maybe there are 8, 10, 15 students at a time, and you get to work with them, you get to see where their challenges are, and you're looking for that spark, mm. that spark that you can really feel and see when they get it. And when they get it, it's like, wow, their world changes and my world changes too. And for for many years, it was super frustrating for me because I was teaching them something that I had learned on my own. Because I studied graphic design, but here I was working at a motion, as a motion designer, directing commercials, directing teams, doing storyboards, things that nobody ever taught me. So I didn't have exactly a great model to emulate and to replicate because I just figured it out on my own. So part of that was I falsely, and, and this happens a lot to, to teachers or people who do something well, is you forget how hard it is to do what it is that you do. And so I was just frustrated with them. Like, why can't you get it? There's no idea here. What are you doing with this angle? Uh, this doesn't make any sense. There's no continuity between shot A and shot B. Where's the surprise? And they're like, oh, what's going on with the teacher? He's like, he's going nuts on us again. And it took me a while to figure it out. Like, dude, you got to chill out. And you have to start to break down the problem into much simpler bite-sized pieces. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the assignments I gave them were extremely conceptual in nature. I'm not talking about like fine art conceptual class, like, oh, yes, I think that's really, <laughs> it's really making me, it's just a commentary on society. No, I'm not talking about that kind. I'm talking about, can you communicate an idea here right. that when somebody looks at what you're doing, they get the same idea? And that is no easy task. And here they are, intro to storyboarding, intro to sequential design. And they have this Asian bald guy like, what is going on with you guys? This doesn't make any sense. Do you care about this at all? So I had to learn how to deal with that. And over time, I eventually got better at it. <laughs> and I heard tales. People went to the bathroom to cry. I didn't know about this at the time. Huh. But they told me later, you're like, you know, you know, Mary, she went to the bathroom to cry. I'm like, no, I thought Mary was having a good time. That's how blue I was. There's no Tap crying in baseball. What are you doing? Uh, <laughs> I'll the reward to answer your question, Maria. Yeah. To, to answer the question, the reward is this. Two years later, I'm back at Art Center. I mean, I'm always there, but... I'm there, I'm going to grad show, I walk through the gallery and I bump into a student. They're like, hey, hi. I'm like, hi. And they're like, do you remember me? I'm like, uh, not totally. I don't, uh, 
student or yeah they, yeah i had your class two years ago i'm like how was i to you and say like oh, you were kind of rough to me <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm a different person today they're like it's okay i was at work i was doing this assignment this project and something that you said two years ago finally clicked i'm like oh my god and they're like happy I'm like, I just have to work on shortening up the timeline between the point, the point in which it clicks to right. like when you feel it. Because yeah. two years is a really long time to wait. But sure. that said sure. a lot to me. It said that the concepts that I was sharing with them were too advanced. I didn't explain it well enough. It wasn't simple enough to understand. And so therefore, it didn't sink in until two years later. That's a failure on my part as a teacher. So what were the level of the students that you were teaching? They were probably between fifth term and eighth term, which is, uh, what is that, S uh, junior to senior, uh, sophomore, one, two, three, four. Yeah, junior to senior years. Okay. And some of them were grad students, some of them, it, it was all over the place because it was an elective mm. that people would take it and there were some prerequisites, but they were they were upper termers. Okay, okay, I yeah. see. Yeah. They were I... like 18 years old, fresh okay. out of <laughs> Yeah, because that's a different beast. I've, I've, I've taught a little bit in dealing with people who are in their first year, which I've done, and people in their fourth year. And there, it's totally different. The, the first, most of the classes I've taught are, have been mid to upper kind of range. And yeah. and fairly recently, I had to jump back and teach first year. And man, I totally forgot. Like, they don't know anything. Half the vocabulary that we use, in this case for architecture or design in general, they don't know. <laughs> and you have to really dial it back. And, and like you were saying, break it up to smaller chunks. That's a really good description, I feel. Yeah. One of the breakthrough moments for me as a teacher was when I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Holtzman, who is a faculty advisor at Art Center. Basically, he teaches the teachers how to teach better. He has a PhD. He's like really deep into pedagogy. He's a super smart, brilliant man. And I had him sit in my class and then he gave me a review afterwards. And I attended some of his workshops, but <clears throat> basically I was teaching class kind of like how I work with my freelance team and my, my employees. But you're talking about people who have graduated school, who have experience, who are being paid and have a professional interest in doing this and there's a lot on the line and they're willing to give everything of themselves and this is all that they're doing. One of the things he told me was this. He said, okay, so I watched you critique. Good job on a couple of things. Here's the thing. The whole intention of teaching is for your students to be able to make the decisions that you're making without you, right? And I said, yeah. So in a way, it's like you're downloading your operating system to them. But when you stand in front of the wall with the work laid out <clears throat> and you critique their work, it's mysterious to them what you see and why you say what you say. Mm -hmm. And you know this because every week they make the same mistakes over and over again. So here's what you should do. Think about it like this. What are the five things that you're looking at or the five things that you're thinking about? Can you describe that? And I was in his office, like on the spot, I'm like, oh, what, what, what is it? Oh, okay. <clears throat> the first thing I'm looking for is, is the image that you're drawing or the, the thing that you're designing, is it clear? So clarity is really important. So if I can't tell what it is, you've lost me already. And that's half the problem. And there are tools and techniques that you can use to make your image clear, like directing the camera, eliminating things in the background, lighting things differently, putting a spotlight on something, lots of things. And my students know this now. What's the next thing? Well, can you tell what's going on from frame to frame? Because, okay, one frame is clear. So it, does the sequence make sense? Oh, okay, now frames, you know, one, uh, two, three makes sense, but frame four, it's a big jump. So it's broken right there and I'm telling a story. So, oh, okay, so you gotta fix that. So every time that you're following your frames and you see something weird and it breaks, what's going on there? Can we fix that? Now, if it's clear and it's sequential and it makes sense, is it interesting? Does right. it ask dramatic questions? So we know how to escalate the drama because this is why people watch and read a sequence. So he had me do this and I did it. Next week I came in, guys, here's the five things. I put it on the wall on one sheet, eight and a half by 11, super clear bullet point. I said, from here on out, I'm not gonna critique your work anymore. I'm gonna call on somebody and then I'll say, Mary, you're on deck. John, you're coming up next. And Bob, you're, you're up third. So they're all like ready, they're awake. They're not just waiting for you to call their name and boom, wake up and like, what am I doing? So they're prepared. So Mary goes up. I said, Mary, what I'd like you to do is first just look at a sequence, don't say anything. 
and then go through this checklist one at a time until you get to the bottom and critique based on the five things on the wall. And this is a, a term that he described to me. He says, it's called scaffolding to autonomy. And it's a super like PhD kind of way of describing <laughs> something, right? Scaffolding, building clear logical steps, a progression in towards a, a, a state where they could just do it by themselves sure. to be autonomous. Scaffolding to autonomy. And that's exactly what happened. So once I started to understand things like that, things became much, much clearer, much easier for, for me to teach and for them to critique. And then their work was getting better. So I, I learned some really valuable lessons there when I said, I have to break the problem down into much simpler bits, but I needed to learn a new teaching model, one that I did not have. <clears throat> if you go to art school, if you go to architecture school, I'm pretty sure it's the same. You bring your work, an elected official, an expert, your teacher, tells you everything that's wrong with it. Sometimes it makes sense to you. Intuitively, you might have felt it, but you couldn't articulate it. And then you go back to your dungeon, AK your house, and you keep working on it again. But the whole process is super mysterious. And that's the model I had emulated for years. So mm. apologies to all the students <laughs> at the before this moment, because I effed it up. I taught you like the way I was taught. I taught you the way I learned. That was not an effective way to teach. So interesting. You know, we, we had just, this is interesting also because we had just done recording uh, maybe two weeks ago with um, a chair of an architect, these are all architecture, but a, a chair of an architecture uh, school, a dean, and then someone else that was a director or, or whatever equivalent title. And um, they were talking about how education has to change or should change. And it was just tied to like, you know, COVID-19 is, is, in, is inducing change. And they're saying, well, these, these alterations should have happened anyway. And one of the big themes of the, the conversation was that a lot of teachers of at least in architecture and I assume design and graphic design and other design as well. Well, first of all, they aren't actually trained as teachers. They're just professionals who get hired to teach. And the second is that we all tend to, as you said, just emulate what was done to us because, hey, I think I turned out okay. So <laughs> maybe this will work, uh, you know, for the students. That makes sense, right? It makes sense. I mean, <laughs> how else are you supposed to teach? You emulate and everything you learn in your life is an emulation or repetition of a pattern you've seen before. Interesting. So if we don't have new patterns. <clears throat> if we don't have new patterns to emulate, what do we do? So this is where I think, um, and I talk about this quite a bit. One of my superpowers is just natural born curiosity, this deep desire to learn more, to know more, to want to do things better. And so I sought out Dr. Holtzman. I started reading books and watching videos on different styles of teaching. So I wasn't content or complacent with like, this must be the best version of me. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think there's ways to improve and I work towards that. And I continue to work on that every single day of my life. I wanted to ask you, what is sequential design? Because it's not a term that I've heard uh, before, actually. Yeah, sequential design. There's a couple of ways you can look at sequential design. The one that everybody's familiar with is if you read a magazine, that's sequential design. Because a story is told across multiple pages and the architect, the designer of the story, has to craft it in such a way that images and words work together in unison to create meaning for you. First of all, it has to be easy to read. It has to flow. And we know this when you when we used to read magazines, it the story would hook you. And of course, they can't give premium space in the magazine for the entire story. So what do they do? They break the story. And then they tell you to go to page 145 to continue the rest of the story, where it's just mostly text in columns, right? We're familiar with this model. Well, that's a break in the sequence. And so there's a high probability that if the story isn't totally 100% captivating or on your way to page 145, you don't get distracted with something else, a cool ad, another story that's like, <laughs> oh, this is really interesting. So this is what we, we refer to as sequential design. The other way of sequential design that other people may be familiar with is comic books. Comic books are the ultimate form of sequential art. Panel by panel, you follow a story, a combination of images and words, that create something else. Scott McCloud talks about this in his book, Understanding Comics. It's a brilliant book, deceptively simple to read. He says something magical happens in between the two frames. If you see a picture of somebody holding a hammer, and then you see a picture of a broken cup, we don't see the person 
striking the cup or the cup breaking. We just see the predominant action and then we see the, the result connected to that. What happens in between your frames is where the magic happens. And Scott McCloud refers to it as called closure. It requires participation from you, the reader, the viewer, to connect the meaning. Uh, other people refer to this as semiotics, the juxtaposition of words and images that create a hybrid meaning. So you look at the thing that isn't there in your mind, and that's what's so powerful. It requires you to participate and do a little bit of work. Mm -hmm. So that's sequential design in comic books. Sequential design in the profession I was practicing it in is <clears throat> sequencing of images, storyboards, that ultimately become the blueprint for a moving piece of animation or video. Okay. So before we shoot the video, before we animate the characters on the screen, before we set pixel into motion, what we have to do is we have to first conceive of what it is that we're trying to do. So we map out the key moments and we design it for that. And we use that to communicate the idea with our client, our, our boss, our team, the, the, the production crew. That's what we use. So that's the blueprint. So that's sequential design. I wish I had taken a class like that. It sounds like <laughs> a lot of fun and also super important for, I would actually almost say any profession. And it's mm -hmm. weird that you had mentioned that, you know, there's the five things and one of them is just clarity and, yep. and missing frames or frames that are confusing. Yes. And, uh, you know, in our profession and probably a lot of others, it's the same thing. And it's so fascinating how those, those two in particular, those basic uh, principles, lessons, whatever, are sometimes the most difficult. And those are always like, that's the first thing that comes up in any review I've been on. It's like, I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> and right. what is that weird thing in the corner? <laughs> right. You could say that's fundamental to design is like, is, is your intention being communicated to the person that it's meant for? Are they seeing what you see? And if not, we have to work on that. Okay. That that is just alone, just a singular image, a piece of architecture or product that you hold in your hands or a beautiful painting or a, a piece of graphic design. It's It's got to be clear. If I can't read it, if I can't process what's going on, you are making me work too hard. And depending on how interested I am, I probably will give up. Yeah. So this is fundamental. This is like foundational to visual art. Is it clear? Okay. Now, the thing that you're talking about, if you, allow, if you indulge me for a little bit sure. here is that what I've found in learning it myself and teaching it to others is how useful this is to things way beyond the things that we're talking about. And I'll give you an example. And let's let's see if I can take you down the rabbit hole and make you a believer, okay? <laughs> when you stand in front of people on a stage at a um, at TED Talk, what you're doing is, if you've done your job well, is you're doing sequential design. How does this story begin? What are the main points in the story that are going to be valuable to the audience who shows up? And how will you summarize all of this so that the lessons you wish wish to teach or to share become crystal clear. And so I found that when I was designing my keynote presentations, that I was actually pretty good at this. And then when I um, was thinking and reflecting back, like, how do I know how to do this? Because I just started doing presentation design a few years ago. Well, if you look at a keynote deck, what is it? It's a series of images and text, sometimes with video and sound, meant to communicate an idea. So I got really good. I was able to move things around just like I did in my class with my students. Like, you know what? This is too deep into the deck. You need to bring this up front because I'm really not that interested in frames one to 10. Hmm. So that idea of drama, you've created no uh, rhetorical questions to ask the audience. You didn't ask them to participate in this and you're just talking to them. So questions like imagine if excite people because they can't help themselves. They start to immediately imagine something. Imagine if what you're wearing was a banana. Imagine if your shoes are four times too big. How difficult would it be for you to walk around, <laughs> right? Imagine if everything that you saw in life, the text was four points too small. How would that make you feel? So those are kinds of the, the questions that escalate interest and they're like, oh, I'm becoming really interested in this. What's really interesting too, as I, as I get deeper into designing my presentations is life, not just presentations, is about the transitions. If you help people with the transitions, the moments where it feels very jarring and they can't connect the two moments, mm -hmm. 
you ease them into that. And I'll give you an example. Uh, and I learned this through my 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 therapist. Uh, my kids, they're they're running around the house. I have two boys, and they're doing whatever they're doing. They're playing, they're drawing, whatever it is they want to do. But seemingly to them, very arbitrarily, uh, a parent will an adult will walk in the room and say, "It's time for you to go to sleep." And they look back up at you know, like, "What?" <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Who, who said that? I was having a really good time right now. And then they have a fit. Because the transition was zero. It was having fun, doing my jam, enjoying my life. And some idiot tall person comes in here and tells them to stop doing that. Arbitrarily. Because why? Their sense of time is very different than ours. So my, my therapist taught me this. It's, it's very easy. It's like, you need to bridge this. So what I do is half an hour before I tell them to you know go to bed... I come into the room and say, it looks like you're having a really good time. I just want to let you know in about 30 minutes, I'm going to come in here and tell you, you got to go to sleep. So plan it yourself accordingly. So we're going to start to wind down and I'm going to come in in five minutes and tell you five minutes before you have to go to bed, it's time to go to bed. So those transitions really help. Those transitions help in a presentation. You have an idea or a personal story and you have this graph. They don't make sense to anybody but you. You have to thread those two things together. You change the graph to tie with the story. And this is information graphics design 101. Or you change the story so that it hits the graph just right. So sequential design, the transitions, the, the moments between the moments are very important to many, many things besides the visual arts. I totally buy into it. I totally buy into it. And I think if you're describing... Um, let's call it the process or the, the transitions well enough, then mm -hmm. the next slide is you're, or then the, the, the user or the viewer or the watcher is already convinced of whatever comes next, which is kind of an interesting way to, um, in, in, I guess, more business terms, like to sell something, right? You don't just puke out the product. It's like, you got to do all the setup and tell them like where, why they need this thing, where they're going, this, why you're going in this direction. And by the time you tell them what the thing is, it's like, well, that makes total sense. It falls into place. Yeah. So yeah, in terms of presentation, you, you're absolutely right. If you want to present a radical design to your client, the last time they saw you was a month ago when they gave you this creative brief. And you go in, your whole team is super pumped, like, yes, I think we nailed it. We hit it out of the ballpark. <clears throat> the boards are all nice and wrapped and ready to go. And you think, okay, we've rehearsed this presentation. Here we go. You do everything you need to do. You're on point. Every word is super clear. There's no filler words. They seem engaged. You flip through one thing after the other. And they're like, what? <laughs> and that's not the reaction that you wanted. That was a surprise. Because they weren't with you the last 30 days. Yeah. They didn't see yeah. this grow <clears throat> and progress and change and the decisions you made and why you did what you did. All they saw was point A and point Z. Mm -hmm. This doesn't make any sense to them at all. So if you want to have better client relationships, instead of having these big presentations, these big reveals, you should be in perpetual alignment, continuous alignment. So instead of waiting 30 days to show them something, show them something every third day. And every key moment that a decision is being made, then they are as much the author and the architect of what it is that you do. At least they feel that way. And then when you show it to them, instead of saying, wow, they say, of course. And that's straight up from the Win Without Pitching Manifesto by Blair Ends. We have to change our desire, our addiction to having the big reveals. Right. And I feel like a lot of designers, that's actually how... That's in a way how they get successful or that's how they 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 maintain their success is through that veil, right? It's like I'm behind the curtain, I'm the Wizard of Oz, I have some mysterious expertise that you don't know about and and that's like their method almost of charging more money, let's say. And it's kind of and I I guess for some comp certainly established companies and some designers that works really well, but I've always found it peculiar especially because if you if you think about this at all in relation to education and you, you know, I, I think we've all had teachers who do the same thing. They come in, they flip over the model, turn upside down or do something weird and they walk out of the room and you're like, what the fuck just happened? I, I guess there's some kind of amazing knowledge he has. So respect and I'm going to follow them kind of thing. Right. 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure that it even is that well thought out. <laughs> really, I'm, I'm, I'm suspicious. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so here's what I think is really happening. Creative people have no idea what the hell they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's just, let's start there. And before you get all the angry emails sent to me, just <laughs> let me explain. Creative people don't know what the hell they're doing. We don't understand our own process. Uh, this is why there's so many one hit wonders, like the bands that just create one thing that's a monster hit, mm -hmm. never to be heard from again. And then there's the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, um, Elton John, who can create hit after hit after hit. How is it possible? It's because they're very aware of what they need to do to create works of art again. So the creative person is entirely insecure, unaware of their own creative process. They, uh, Michael uh, uh, Bungay Stanier said, you know, writing is really easy. You just stare at a piece of paper until blood forms on your forehead and that's how you write. <laughs> oh, so it's this process of like incredible torture and agony and anxiety because we don't know if it will happen, when it will happen, we just grind through it. And so the idea of sharing that process with another human being, one that has power over you in terms of financial means and other opportunities, recommendations, who would want that? Like, I don't want you to look at this because it's horrible and it's tragic until it's done. And even still, it's like, it, it just, it's done because we ran out of time. So there's probably a larger conversation that we're probably not ready to dive into today about helping creative people understand and design a process, a way that they can work through a problem, that they can have predictable and repeatable results. So I think it's mostly just that. Like if I hmm. had, if that instructor, he or she goes in and tells you this is stupid, just turns it up, throws it in the trash, they're just having an emotional outburst like a man child. <laughs> they can't even articulate to you what's wrong. They're just like, nah, stupid. And that didn't help anybody. That was just a demonstration and and uh, of just ego, I think, and raw passion and emotion that probably is not really helpful to anybody. Yeah. I mean, if your intention is to scare your students, it is to create frustration and intimidate them and to belittle them, that's 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 probably you shouldn't be in education at all. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's a tactic. It's a one-trick pony. It's it's very shallow uh, and also kind of mean. Uh, I do wonder, though, kind of jumping from that, not not having to do so much with um, the the ir the irrational nature of that individual, but more about process, like you were saying. Um, if if the process is too much established, or let's say too much the same between different things, at what point do you begin to wonder? Uh, it's going to dictate the same kind of outcomes too much. Does that make sense what I'm saying sort of? Yes, I, I think you're you're, you're sharing a, a, a question that a thought that many creative people have as soon as I tell them that if you could design a formula for your creative work, then it's too formulaic for mm -hmm. them. And here's the thing. It's like if you can write, uh, let it be a uh, hundred times and, and make whatever success and money from that song, would you not want it? You know, if, if like some kind of devilish creature appeared and said, look, we're, we're willing to offer you this gift that you can have hit after hit of the same thing over and over again and people love it all through the world. Would you like this at no cost to you? I think a lot of creative people would walk away. <laughs> Just be honest. Yeah. They would. You know what? I don't like what you're selling me. I'd rather struggle through this and live in anonymity and just make uh, my rent barely every single month live paycheck to paycheck. I'd rather do that because I'm in love with the the creative process. You know, I'm in love with results. And I think that's, that's the biggest problem with the creative profession, right? Is that you get kind of like the divorce relationship between being a good businessman and being a good designer is and oftentimes it oftentimes it feels like people have to choose between the two. Mm. Yeah. 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 I think we have to have a different conversation then, right? Why is it that we have to choose one or the other? I think being a good designer is being a good business person. I agree. Because you can build a sustainable practice. Because we have we, we have friends, both you, all of us, and everybody listening, we have friends that we think are supremely talented. 
but they're just struggling. They're their own worst enemy. And they're not going to make their dent in the universe. So if you have an idea that is spread and shares uh, is that shared throughout the world, that idea wins. Let's talk about VHS versus Betamax, right? For they're like, what? What is he talking about? <clears throat> in every new format, there's a war between the predominant companies that want to own the format because there's a lot of money to own the format. Betamax is a superior form of delivering video to VHS. They fight, VHS wins. For a number of different reasons, it wins. Not the superior format, but it wins that format war. Mm -hmm. Just like HD DVD versus Blu-ray. Again, two companies battled it out, or corporations, not more than two companies, and then one format wins. So that format gets to spread its idea again and again. So if you're a creative person and you have a creative idea, and it's your artwork, it's your design, it's an, uh, it's your invention, but you can't get it out there because you don't know how to run a business, you don't know how to support yourself, you can't continue to do what it is that you do. So in a way, your idea dies. Mm -hmm. And that's tragic because people who are better at this, <clears throat> inferior ideas, win. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting you say that. And we certainly feel the same way. That's probably why we have a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not an idea that maybe most designers necessarily think about, but it's true. If you, no matter whatever greatness you have in you, or if it exists outside of you on a piece of paper, on a board, if no one's seeing it, it doesn't get a certain amount of exposure, then I don't, I don't know. I guess it still has value somehow, right? Some, some spiritual value in the universe, value. but I, you yeah. know. Uh, it, it, it could have more. So I want to ask you then, because I know for us, like when we started the podcast, there was a turning point and the question that you pose is the one that kind of came to the forefront of our minds. Um, you're, you're at school and college, right? Studying design. Uh, you go and practice. When did you know that you would be doing your own thing? And when did you know, like the future, blind, all these things? Was it a turning point? Was it a moment? Was it a slow progression toward started to becoming more autonomous? Yeah, I, I think I've always known. I think I've known since I was seven years old mm -hmm. I was going to have a business. Because I've had many failed businesses between seven and 21. I really, really? have. I sold candy. I sold Ninja Stars. I sold ice cream. <laughs> Anything that I could think I could sell and make, I would sell it. And I was really, like, I had a car washing business that didn't last that long, but I did. <laughs> Right, because it was too hard. I was too small. It was too hard to do. And I was like, "Is there more that I could do with my brain, and less that I could do with my body?" Because I have physical constraints I'm working against. All right, I, I go and dream up all kinds of different businesses. Uh, I even wanted to, believe it or not, uh, have a warm farm. I wanted to grow worms. Oh, much wow. to my <laughs> I like what? Those things? I'm like, yeah, mom, because I don't have to buy worms to go fishing. And I can sell it to my friends. And she said, thank God. She's like, this is, I don't like this idea. Right? Okay, you can grow it right here by the side of the house. Okay, no, don't do that. So when I was in school, I was helping people. And luckily for me, I was very studious. I learned the lessons that my teachers taught really quickly. And other students, my classmates started to recognize this and they would ask me for help. Some of them were from different majors, asked me to help them with their brochures. And some I charged money, some I did for free just to help my friends out. And so there was already kind of a little bit of a side business that was going. So I knew something was there for me. Uh, but fate would have it, have it that uh, I was offered a job before I graduated school. And I took a semester off and went to work in advertising. And it was wonderful. It was a totally new experience. And I was working on big accounts i had a corner office i mean things were just like clicking like god life isn't so hard this, this <laughs> world is it's pretty good like my my boss at that time uh had offered me a, a full-time position when i finished school that was double the salary i was currently getting paid more than double actually and to sweeten the deal because i was like i don't know if i want to work here um so just just for for posterity let me just say so people aren't guessing when when this is in 1994 95 okay kid out of school still in school actually uh i was paid forty thousand dollars i was living in seattle and los angeles because it was just for a semester so they got me a corporate apartment and they gave me an expense account it's like what is going on with my life because Whoa. i thought i was gonna make twenty seven thousand dollars a year but in the few short months months that i worked there my boss kevin He's like, I, I really want you to work here. I'm like, ah, I don't know. I said, like, I'll pay you $85,000. I'm like, wow. Whoa. Uh, and I'm like, ah, I still don't, I don't know. I just, 
Uh, what if you work three days a week? Um, yeah, I, don't, I just, I, I don't know. What if, what if we just gave you studio space here? Cause we have a lot of space. Uh, you can start your own design company in here. We don't care as long as you are able to do your work. You can hire your friends and you can run it. At that point, I'm like, okay. Who was this Kevin guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's amazing. I'm still friends with him today, but he's amazing. He's a senior a creative director, copywriter, right? And I learned a couple of things because I asked him, like, Kevin, you know, why, why would you do this for me? I feel really guilty because my friend who studied advertising, who was my partner at that time, um, this is her life and I get offered this and people are looking at me funny at the office. Uh, he's like, you know, here's the thing, man. First of all, you do something that's very special. I'm a writer and writers are a dime a dozen, but I haven't seen somebody like you who can take words and make them into things because I want all my ads to be run through you. I'm like, wow, okay. Oh, well, that's, that's. And he says, here's the other thing. You work so hard that I want people here who show up at nine o'clock and leave at four and take a two hour lunch to be put on notice from this point forward. So to me, it's just like you're setting the bar so high that I want other people to feel uncomfortable because they're getting lazy here. <laughs> like, wow. So I learned a lot of lessons there. Lesson number one is if you don't want something as much as the other side, whoever wants it less has lots and lots of leverage. Because although the job was great and what he was offering me was great, it wasn't what I had set out to do in my life. I didn't want to necessarily work in advertising. I wanted to work in design. So leverage is on your side if you don't want it. Lesson number two, if you work like hell, people do notice. You don't have to tell anybody, just work. And people will notice, especially because depending on the corporate culture that you're in, you, you really stand out. And so then those things open up for you if you do that. And... What he was willing to do was to meet me at every every unspoken um, need or want or desire. And he just knew. He knew what I wanted. I wanted to do my thing because he knew this wasn't going to be the thing that was going to keep me here. Now, long story short, it turned out I didn't love advertising that much, even with all the things he, he had offered. And so I just quit. But for that time, it was pretty amazing because I returned to school. I was flying back and forth from Los Angeles to Seattle like every other week. He's like, go to school for a couple of good days and then fly back here. And the corporate apartment they put me in was way better than the one I lived in. They, it had weekly maid service. The fridge was stocked with stuff. And I was like, God, this is just better than my life. <laughs> but ultimately, you kind of have to pursue what it is that you think you were meant to do in your life, regardless of how many carrots are dangled in front of you. And that's ultimately what I did. And at that time, did you have a sense of what that was, though? Because that's the big question for a lot of people. Um, you know, they they know, and there's a difference between, I think especially for sole proprietors, there's a big difference between, um, let's say, the work, which is the, uh, the, the designing itself at your desk and working versus like what you're doing, which is much more expansive. So when did you know that it wasn't just the craft of design that you wanted, but it was this bigger picture? Are you talking about the future now, or the, <laughs> yeah, you're you're the you're the future, or or the blind, or anything like this? I mean, because okay. you're saying you're at the advertising agency, you knew that this is oh, okay, isn't yes. quite it. Okay, because you're asking a much bigger question than the decision why I left the agency, which was really simple. Which oh. was, I wanted to be like my heroes. My heroes were designing album art. They were working on cutting edge magazines about music and culture, and they were working on intricate packages and things that were just super juicy with design in an advertising clarity is really important right because they pay for this ad space they they have to get a certain result and outcome out of it and so you you add stuff you actually in, in many cases you're hurting the communication so it gets stripped down to like here's an image and Treat it simply, and here's a big, bold headline, and why Futura Bold is such a, a favorite typeface for people who work in advertising, because it's just super legible, and it's bold. Hmm. There wasn't a lot of room for me to use everything that I had learned, and so the constraints put on me was really weird. And I remember also thinking, man, there's a lot of people working on a single image. There was a writer, and then I was the art director, and then there was a creative director, and then there was a whole print production team behind this, 
usually they're referred to as studio in most agencies, and they do all the production art. They make your comp into something that will reproduce well. And so we would work on something for weeks for a single image that I didn't think was like a piece of art. Mm. And in my mind, in my immature, undeveloped mind, I was like, I think I could make three, four, five ads in the time that it takes this whole <laughs> thing to happen. And it seems like such a tragic waste of human potential. Right. So I was kind of bristling against that. Like, isn't there more that, like, I don't need print production department. I know how to do separations. I know how to do all this, but I, I was taking somebody's job away and that wasn't cool. So there was a whole structure in place, right? Because most traditional art directors at that time were mostly idea people. They would sketch something out and like put this and this together and somebody else would have to make it because they're not going to work on it. So that was a, a big part of the problem is like, I wanted my hands in it. I wanted to do many things. Like I could create a whole magazine in the time it takes to do this thing. I really could. And it felt like you, you have this super fast, expensive sports car, but it's just parked in the garage the whole time. Right. It doesn't right. get to go anywhere. And that's where I was like, I think I just need to be in a place where I could just express myself and make art and design and get paid for it. That's why it didn't work out for me. You know, what's also fascinating is that you, how do I put this? I feel like there are a lot of successful business people. And when we talk to them, they're not quite so introspective and they're, they're convincing for sure. And they have interesting things to say, but for you, it's that, but also you seem to be very introspective. You seem to be very, like you've thought about yourself and what it means to be a human being through this whole process. Uh, I hope that makes sense. And I'm wondering, where does that come from? Okay. You said introspective. It comes from my introversion. <laughs> right? It really is. Because growing up, I, I've never felt like I've belonged to any community ever. It was like, I'm, I'm not white enough. I'm not Asian enough, depending on where I hang out. And that's the problem. And I'm artistic and creative, but I'm not macho. I'm not athletic. I'm not these things. So I was just like, where am I? Where's my tribe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm looking for them and I can't find them. And, and it just so happens that in high school, my best friends, the people that I would hang out with are mostly women. I just felt like more comfortable hanging out with women. And the guys naturally uh, just assume like, oh my God, like what a player. I'm like, I'm not a player. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> just because I just don't like your macho male energy, your your bro vibes, right? The dumb practical jokes, the way that you talk about people, especially other women. It's like, wow, I, I just, I'm not comfortable. But then it, it, amongst women, I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm, I'm not asexual either. I'm like, come on, this is really weird. So hmm. I've had a lot of time practicing not saying anything when when you don't say anything and and there's a lot of reasons why for much of my like adolescence and young adult life uh, I, I hardly say any words a lot of reasons one is i'm i'm an esl person and um i i, I mentioned i think um, that i'm vietnamese and so our language is monosyllabic and complicated compounded words and syllables were a struggle for me to say and i shared a story my teacher, his name is Mr. De Leon. Few letters, many syllables. And I had the hardest time, so I wouldn't even raise my hand. Like, if I was confused, I didn't even want to say, Mr. De Leon, I have a question. And ultimately, I had to tell him, it's like, you know, I, I struggle with this. He's like, just call me Mr. D then. I'm like, okay, I'll work on that. And so, what do I do? I just sit around and watch people. I think about my thoughts, and I just sit there. Like many introverted, shy, nerdy, geeky people do, I imagine. We just sit there with our thoughts because we don't know what to say to people. And I remember this. Uh, fast forward now. I'm out of school. I'm a couple of years now. I have my company. I'm working on this big uh, national campaign for a major car manufacturer. I get invited to the meeting and I'm just like scared out of my mind because when you walk into this meeting, it's like there are 18 people sitting around a ginormous configuration that feels like a conference room table, but it's not. So you have everybody from the agency, you have everybody from the client, you have everybody from the production company, the director, his producer, art director, and then you have little me. I'm the solo flyer in this whole room. And they're talking about, this is the pre-production meeting before they go and shoot the, uh, for 14 days on this car commercial, right? 
and they're like okay and everybody introduces them so i'm like oh my god you know like the kid who sits there like oh my god oh my god it's gonna be it's going around the room eventually i have to say something <laughs> <laughs> right I'm, I'm feeling my my heart is like pounding out of my chest you get you get the the clammy hands like oh my god i i give but the shortest introduction and then they start talking creative i'm like oh the name was tough i had to talk creative with these people I, and mind you i already have the job at this point i was like i gotta get out of this room i i only tell you this story because it's been a real struggle. It's been a struggle to relate to other human beings, to be able to stand in front of somebody and say, here's what I think. Now, with your friends and your family, you could do this, but everywhere else, it's the fear of being judged. Do they understand me? Do I say this something stupid? Am I gonna accidentally spit on somebody? All these kinds of things. So I've spent a lot of time in my head. So the introspection comes from introversion. Do you feel like you've overcome that issue now that you yeah. are all over social media, YouTube channel, you're actually talking to the world? Do you, was that part of the process of working out those types of issues that you had? Yeah, you know, it's like going through puberty in public. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what is that? That's a hair, I believe. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, I mean, if you think about it, the, the very first videos that we produce with my friend Jose, who was very generous, he's like, let's go and make content for YouTube. And I was thinking, no, I don't think so. I have a business to run. And I made 35 excuses why I didn't want to do it. And he accepted zero of them. He said, look, here, you just sit there. He didn't say it like this, but that's how I heard it. Like, you sit there like a dummy. I do all the talking. When you feel like you want to say something, if you ever want to say something, say it. I'm like, okay. So we recorded episode after episode. And I would go home every night. And I, I couldn't figure it out. But the next day, my jaw would hurt. Like if I had been chewing on gum all day long. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure out why. And then later on, it dawned on me uh, because I became aware of it during the taping. My jaw was clenched so tight that it was creating like some tension here. I was like, oh my God, I got to get through this. And, and, and those videos are still up. If you watch them, it's horrific. I, I'm not <laughs> encouraging anybody to do it, but we still leave it there for just humility. Uh, so you can laugh at me and see the progression. So this is what I mean. It's like going through puberty in public. And I was like, I got to get better at this. And, you know, through practice and staying in the pocket, the pain, Mm -hmm. uh, the resistance starts to disappear and you get a little bit better and i remember just uh, to keep this real real you guys don't always see these things but we would uh briefly rehearse before we were live or before we started recording and even introducing myself saying your own name like hey everybody my name is blah, blah. And i couldn't even say it so it took many episodes before i told jose jose let me try the intro and I had to do it once and we'd mess it up twice. And I was like, a third time, okay, I, I think I can do this, guys. I can do this. And then I would be able to say it. There's something, and, and you guys know this a little bit, there's something very frightening about looking into a one-eyed technological machine, a camera. It has no soul. It doesn't emote. It doesn't give you any feedback. You stare into it, and then you think, from this point forward, Whatever it is that I say is going to be recorded for all of human history. I'm not sure I want that kind of pressure. There is no undo here. And that's super daunting. But you do it and you keep doing it and it gets a little bit less terrible. I'm not saying it gets great. And it's just over time, calluses build up and you get okay with it. I do public speaking and my, my, my business coach, Keir McLaren, he told me, you got to get out into the world. Nobody knows who you are outside of a very small circle. And I, I got to just, you got to just do it, Chris. And I did it. And I sucked and it was terrible. <laughs> Everything that could go wrong goes wrong. The deck doesn't work. My notes are gone. I'm handwriting the notes now. And they they sandwich me between superstars, people oh, I yeah. looked up to. And, you know, it's horrible. If you have to sit there through somebody's great presentation and you're the third person to go and you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> And you start to rewrite the deck in your mind and you're like, that's dangerous, don't do that. Because you haven't said it before. And I remember I, I got onto stage in a darkened room in front of people that I respected and liked, had to talk about typography. My voice was like trembling and they could all feel this nervous energy. And I just could not wait for this thing to be over. 
Now, somebody who was in attendance there told me they have tape of it because it, as far as I know, doesn't exist anywhere. I'm like, if, if you care about me, if you like me, if you want to see the future continue, please never let that thing go out. <laughs> destroy that sucker because it is probably even worse than I'm describing it to you now because I could feel their nervousness for my nervous for right. my nerve it right, was right. horrible and you just keep doing it it's so it's so so funny do you still get nervous before uh live presentations or even before recording a video I do I do and it's different levels of nerves <laughs> uh, sadly uh, I'm a glutton for punishment because when when event organizers asked me to do a talk i actually care enough to write a new talk <laughs> wow. they yeah. just give the same talk they yeah. somehow bend it or they just say i'm doing this talk and i don't care if the theme fits or not and then organizers agree because they're well known or they're a good speaker or whatever i'm the i'm the guy who's in my hotel room up to four in the morning writing and rewriting what it is that i do and so usually it, it's it's the the calm before the storm, the the nerves backstage. I'm like, oh my God, what am I gonna say? Because I know I just gotta get through the first five minutes. If I can get through that and set the tone and intention and loosen up, every, everything is just gonna fall into place. Of course, I won't say anything perfect, but that's okay. I just gotta get through those first five minutes. And the backstage, if anybody's seen me, I'll be walking around like a weird zombie in another place. Like, like I don't see you and you don't see me. And people try and talk to me, I'll just like, nah, I can't really talk to you right now. <laughs> This is not an act. Like I got to go through my my pre-show prep, and I got to start to get in that zone. And it's sometimes it happens fairly easy, and sometimes it does not. It's so weird. I mean, we or I guess I mostly do lectures here and there, or oh, speak yeah, for the I don't class, do that. Right. <laughs> and uh, not nearly at your scale. But and uh, but I've done it enough, and I've performed like on stage. We could say enough to where you would think nerves would go away. And sometimes they're not there. It's fine. And other times I'm like a total wreck. And I, and for the life of I cannot figure out what formula exists, what what variables there are that cause it to be one way or the other. Like one time I'm fine, the other time I'm puking before the presentation. It's like what's happening right now? I know my stuff. <laughs> I think I've I've narrowed down a few variables. Okay, let's hear it. Okay, it's interesting that there is a weird size of audience that my nerves kick in. Under a hundred, no problem uh over a couple thousand no problem it's somewhere there in the middle where i can kind of see every single person and it looks like a lot of people <laughs> that becomes a little bit of a problem uh when they sandwich you between people that you're like uh I, and i hope they sandwich you between people that suck because I, nothing boosts your confidence like no matter how bad i do i'm gonna be better than that because we we're, we compare, right? We are yeah. like, oh my good, that guy was good. She was amazing. So fluid, that presentation. Oh my God. Now, luckily, I, I'm probably gonna get in trouble for saying this, but I'm just gonna say it anyways. When you speak at a design conferences, most of them are not very good public speakers. Mm. Oh, yeah. So thank God the cards are kind of stacked in your favor. If you work at this, you're gonna be at least, you know, in the middle of the pack and I just don't want to be the worst. So that's that's those are some things. I think if they, if they have um, a, a warm introduction for you, that you feel like the, somebody's do, doing a little bit of work on your behalf, so the audience doesn't sit there and like, who the hell are you? I, I think if the audience knows who you are and they specifically show up for you, it, it helps me out a lot. So when I'm speaking at certain conferences where it's like one person's talking UX, UI, and something else, things I don't, I don't know anything about. So I start to think, how do I change my content to fit this audience? And it becomes really difficult. Mm -hmm. So if the audience knows you and you know the audience, it becomes more like, hey, we're friends, we're getting together. I think I've learned a few things. Maybe it'll help you, maybe it won't. I don't know, but I'm gonna try. Then it just becomes a lot easier. And I think it's all just comes with, are they familiar? Are you familiar with them? And do we feel like family? Is this my tribe? Mm -hmm. And it goes back to my childhood. Is this my tribe? Yeah, yeah, interesting tribe aspect i mean a lot of that actually i sort of identify with uh being asian american and not it's funny when you were saying like a lot of your close friends were female i had a pretty good balance but more female friends than than i think a lot of guys do and the, mm -hmm. the whole bro scenario never really i was in the band and stuff <laughs> you know if you're in the band then you're not really a, a bro i don't think yeah. anyway um <clears throat> i did have a specific question which was uh, so with the marketing, branding, graphic design, storytelling, um, 
over the course of your career, has the game of, of being successful in those uh, industries um, changed dramatically because of technology? Like, I kind of wonder, uh, so specifically, when you were talking about um, the sequential design and the importance of that, now things are so chopped up, it's kind of like, does that... I'm sure it still applies, but how does it apply less, sort of? Because, like, I was on TikTok the other day, and it's just a... I don't understand that platform. It's just a mash <laughs> of, like, randomness. And so I wonder, like, how much of your job now is, is having to adapt to new things? Or do you find that it's... the core principles and a lot of aspects are the same throughout this whole process? That's a really good question. I think the rise of social platforms, distribution networks being decentralized, from the hands of a few because uh, it, it wasn't even that long ago that facebook didn't exist right that before then they're kingmakers and they would anoint you as worthy of making money and being successful gallery owners curators would say you're an artist worth paying attention to so there could be somebody in the middle of the country who's doing an amazing artwork that rivals the things that we see in galleries and exhibitions but they just don't have that friend the same thing about graphic design and illustration, there was no way. You'd have to go through an art buyer, somebody who was going to show you favor and say, look, we think you're good for this campaign. And so there's been a whole system and industry of gatekeepers to hold uh, certain people out and to keep certain people in mm -hmm. for whatever reason. This has nothing to do with, I don't think, with race, religion or anything like that, but they're just, they have preferences. The strength of your network really comes to bear to see how successful we are. All of that has changed. The old guard doesn't want to let it go. They want to pretend like it hasn't changed, but people who are smart enough wake up and you can be a kid in Nigeria or in the Philippines and you can make something that the world could see and fall in love with and they have no idea what size and shape and color you are just because they get to see the work. And there is a certain democratization and, and crowd intelligence that it seems to be that the good stuff rises to the top if you don't sabotage yourself. So now we live in this new world, a new paradigm exists where the old idea of you having to pursue a client and their gatekeepers may be eroding or totally gone at this point. You have a direct pathway to a brand, to a product or a service, and they can reach out to you and, and you can be connected and you could be in the same tribe as them and so that has changed in terms of adapting your content to the different platforms uh, i i call it platform chasing so people don't focus on good content they don't focus on their craft they don't try to to write better or be better at design or illustration or art and so what they think is there's a new platform they chase that platform because you know this if you get in on the ground floor and the platform blows up you become kind of grandfathered in you become one mm -hmm. of the early pioneers of that platform and they love you and they feature you but that's like left for a few people and then you could invest your time and energy figuring out the platform and then it could go bust which many of them do i still think this that if you know how to tell a story sequential design if you can give other people value, if you give generously of the things that you have to offer and don't hold back, if you're true and you're authentic to who you are. And I want to talk about that in a second, but and if you're able to do that, it doesn't really matter what platform you're on. I see Seth Godin's uh, Instagram account and it's up to 200,000 followers right now. He has uh, over a million followers on Twitter and he's been writing a blog post every single day for 20 plus years. He's not going to have a problem moving into whatever platform he wants. The need to move to a platform generally comes from where the attention is. And right now, all these platforms are competing against each other and are doing a pretty good job of giving you the exposure that you want. I think LinkedIn has been a late bloomer, but in the last year, I've seen them make a lot of changes having been acquired by Microsoft to make it a platform where people want to spend more time on, not just a resume site. And we, we're seeing that. I like that. I like that there are a couple of big players in the game and they're all competing against each other. I, I recently found out that uh, Instagram is going to start to turn on badges, which allows people who like your content to donate money to you. Mm. 
And and I think they're doing that because we're not going to make content for you because there's no way for us to sustain ourselves. Basically, you capture all the money, share some of it with the people who make the content. And it's only through competition that these companies are doing it. It's not because they're benevolent or or, or very generous. They're not. They're super cheap, actually. Mm-hmm. But they know that in order to attract and keep talent, you're going to have to pay for it. Spotify is getting in on this game. Yeah. They just yeah. uh, did a $100 million deal with Joe Rogan. <laughs> and they're going to be putting video up on their site. So we're seeing things change. And I like that. There's more players than Twitch now. Microsoft has a platform. Sony has a platform. And they have to pay to bring an audience in. If you happen to have an audience that's willing to travel with you, your value in the world gets higher. It goes up. Do you find that more on the graphic design end of things, let's say the aesthetics of things, that you're having to keep up with trends more often and that it's uh, that that like um, trends and aesthetics recycle more quickly because of this as well? Yeah, I'm not a big believer in trends. Um, I talk about this a lot. It's like, again, previously people were platform chasing. Now they're trend chasing because the only reason why people aren't looking at my work is because it's not on trend. Or maybe it's because it's bad and you don't have anything to say because your research was only surface deep. That's the problem, right? It's superficial. It is what you do. Or you are just doing what everybody else is doing, which is here are 10 popular posts and you're just going to regurgitate the same thing over and over again. But yours looks even worse than the one that I saw. <laughs> Why would you do that? And so that's probably the problem. And so the the subject of trends becomes very popular in search and blogs because everybody wants that silver bullet follow this formula and you're going to be rich and famous and everybody's going to love you it just doesn't work like that and what people are saying gradients are trends like really <laughs> helvetica is a trend come on <laughs> you're just too um ignorant to 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 even form that opinion these things have been around like shapes are a trend like shut up shapes have been a trend <laughs> since the, the invention of shapes i suppose <laughs> you think about it, it's just geometry dude just relax so if you go back to the foundational things if you know how to um, control the page, the screen, and direct somebody's eye through contrast, through repetition, through dissonance, through pattern and texture and line, through lighting and colors, you're going to be just fine. You really are. It just might not be as, uh, might not happen as quickly as you want it to be. And I feel like now younger designers want things to happen quicker and quicker. I think there's this kind of illusion that people have that um, you can achieve success through the social media platforms and it happens overnight or very quickly, or that's the shortcut. Like I was on a design review for not architecture. I think it's kind of like fashion design sort of, and it was about marketing as well. And the students had to present this, this brand and also how they're going to make it become successful. And pretty much all the students said, I'm going to use this influencer because they're a friend of a friend and they're going to blast my thing out in the universe. And that's, that's how I'm solving the marketing issue. And some of the critics were like, that's actually not one that's proven to not work as well. But two, that seems incredibly lazy, a lazy way to think about this problem. Well, now you're going to open up a can of worms here. Let me look at the time here. All right. <laughs> okay. Here's the problem. Everybody wants instant gratification, instant noodles, uh, ready in 30 seconds. Everything is fast, 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 fast food, fast life, fast living. And people don't appreciate just learning the craft and putting in your time. And it could just happen that your third post blows up like a nuclear bomb and everybody loves you. But you're setting yourself up for a lot of disappointment. And unhappy, what is it? Uh, your happiness divided by expectations or something like that. Your <laughs> happiness is that quotient, something about expectations. So if you sit there and think, oh man, I'm going to post this and it's going to blow up. I'm going to set the Instagrams on fire. I, I just think you're silly, you're delusional, and I just think you're not, your your heart is not in it. In the book, The Dip, written by Seth Godin, he talks about this and he says, things that you want should be difficult to achieve because the act or the difficulty the is a natural barrier to keep people out, which creates scarcity. So if you want something and everybody can do it, it's not very rare, therefore it's not very valuable. Right? Gold and platinum is valuable because it's not everywhere oxygen and, and water, less valuable because it's everywhere. So you want it to be difficult. The problem is we don't want to go through the process 
of the pain of discovery, the anxiety of it not working, the frustration that what we have in our head isn't as good as what we can make. And so we give up. And I think that's wonderful. I actually am sitting in the back of the bleachers cheering because you know what? I don't want all this competition. I want it to be difficult. I went through the pain and if it's painful, it'll keep a lot of people out. Hmm. So I get uh, messaged on, on social platforms all the time. Chris, look at my thing. It's just, I've tried everything and it didn't work. I click on their feet at six posts. I said, you know what? Post 16 more before you even talk to me. <laughs> like six posts in, you think you've already <laughs> figured it out? That you put in the good effort and everything should work for you now? Or because it didn't work for you, what people are saying doesn't work? No, you haven't put your time in. Figure it out. And just to kind of keep things in context here, I think... It took me over a year to get to 2,500 followers on Instagram and another year to get to 5,000. First, admittedly, I didn't even try, but I was like, you know, now that I'm making an effort, God, it's hard because the initial burst of all your friends and people who know about you is there. Now you have to earn every single one that's coming in. It's been a journey. And then you start to figure things out. I didn't give up and I didn't give up on YouTube just because the first videos we made had 12 views. Who cares? Uh, there's a young man, his name is uh, Unmesh Dinda, and he has a YouTube channel called Pix Imperfect, and he teaches Photoshop. And he's a, he's a young guy from India, and I recently met him and had him on our show. And he said that he made a commitment to make 100 videos, and he didn't care if anybody watched him. And he said that during this period, he gained a grand total of like 600 followers or subscribers. So I'm like, 100 videos, basically the average is six followers per video. Man, the return on investment is horrible. <laughs> you know, today, I think he has almost 2 million subscribers to his channel. And because of the platform, he's able to make enough money in ad revenue alone that he doesn't need to do any commercial work. He All the stuff he gives, he gives away for free. That's what it takes. So just ask yourself this question. Am I going to make a commitment today to do 100 things before I even think about, like, is this working? If you're not, don't even start. Just quit now. It's totally okay. Find something where you can make that commitment. Hit that ball a hundred times. Swim that river a hundred times. Make carousel posts 100 times. Make a hundred YouTube videos and then talk to me afterwards and maybe I can help. But I know I won't have to help you because by the time you hit a hundred, you'll have figured stuff out. Interesting. Okay, one final question. Favorite place to eat <laughs> in uh, LA region? Favorite place to eat? Um, I like Japanese food. I also like Vietnamese food, and I can get it both on Sautel. So there's a strip on Sautel that's uh, like Little Tokyo, and you can go there and eat. So Perfect. Our list of restaurants uh, recommended by guests is growing. <laughs> <laughs> and this was amazing. I mean, is there anything that we didn't cover? I mean, there's a lot we didn't cover. But is there anything else that you wanted to add before we uh, close out? No. I mean, if you if uh, people enjoyed the many rants and ramblings of whatever it is that I said, uh, if you want to find out more about me, you can find me everywhere on the internet and mostly on social media at the Chris Doe. And I just remembered something. I said I was going to talk about authenticity. I was oh, just going to bring that yes, back. Yes. Yeah. I need to finish that. Uh, it's an open loop, an open story loop, and now we need to close it. So here's something that I think um, is especially prevalent on social media is that we always try to put our best self in front of everybody. If if 90% of our life sucks, we curate it down to that 10%. So there's a lot of fakeness and artificiality out there. I'm not saying it's a horrific, like premeditated thing that people are doing. Naturally, if your hair is bad, if you got a giant pimple, you might turn the other way. And that's natural. But I think in that we start to believe that that's who we are and that's the world we want, what we want from us. I'm finding tremendous power and connection with just being real. So if you lost a job and life isn't working, you made a horrible logo, sometimes show that too. And that you're going to find out that people don't want perfect people. They want people who have interesting stories, who have character flaws. And through that, they relate to you. So if you have perfect teeth, perfect skin, perfect hair, perfect body, perfect life, I think there are some people who will follow you and for sure, but I think there's way more power in just, you know what? I'm messy. 
Um, I fought with my partner. Things didn't work out. And I'm a flawed person just like you. And it's totally okay to be that. Love it. Thanks, everyone, for listening to this week's episode of The Midnight Charette. And thanks to our guest, Chris. Very insightful. Really enjoyed speaking with him. And I hope we get to talk to him again. I hope we get to meet him in person, mm. really. Very, uh, very, very nice yeah. guy. Yeah, very inspiring conversation. Uh, a lot of good tips, which is interesting to talk to different designers because yeah, you understand parallels. that there is parallels between yeah. professions. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Huge parallels. Um, see, we're all the same. It's all one love. Uh, we are on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Uh, more often than not, I would say, on YouTube. Subscribe to us on any one of those places. If you like what we're doing, show us your support by leaving us a review in the Apple iTunes uh, store, the podcast app on your iPhone. Um, that is the best way to, to support us. If you can't do that and you hate Apple... <laughs> then uh, just shoot us an email with uh, some words of encouragement or go on YouTube and leave some comments and that everything helps. And, all the, and we see all the reviews you're, you're doing and all the Facebook likes and things like this. It all means a lot to us and all of it helps us keep going and uh, get exposure for more people and bigger guests and things like this. And if you have any suggestions on topics or guests you want to see on the show, or if you have any questions that you would like us to give you some input on, feel free to text our hotline, the Midnight Shard hotline, at 213-222-6950. You can either text or, like I said, uh, leave a voicemail, and we will play it during recording and get back to you as soon as we can. Awesome. Thanks again for listening. It means a lot to us. Great stuff coming in the future. <laughs> the future. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Bye-bye.